Hi everyone. My name is Carissa Zimmerman and I'm part of the team here at Great Lakes Neurotechnologies. One of my job responsibilities is to work with clinical trial sponsors to integrate our wearable technology into their protocols. Through my experience, I have learned a lot and seen some unexpected things happen. I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned by talking about some of the mistakes that are frequently made when integrating wearable technology into clinical trials. Mistake number one, the wearable is not validated. What does it mean to have validated technology? Well, think about the disease state that your protocol is written for. That disease state is going to have traditional outcome measures that are used to track disease progression and severity, and those are outcome measures are considered the gold standard. If the output from your technology has been published in scientific journals and directly correlated to the traditional outcome measures, then that technology has been validated. An example of this is our Kinesia 1 system. Kinesia 1 is a sensor system combined with a mobile application on an iPad, and it has been validated to use for Parkinson's disease. If a study sponsor wanted to use this to track a subject's movement after stroke, it wouldn't be validated to do so. Even though in both applications, the sensor would be monitoring the subject's movement, you just can't take a technology and move it from one application to another, even though it seems similar, and think that it's still gonna be validated. Mistake number two, loosely defined quantitative outcome measures. Any type of wearable technology that you choose is going to provide some type of data output. Your protocol is going to call for specific outcome measures, and that is not going to be raw data. What is important for a study sponsor to do is to talk with the technology company to ensure that whatever output the technology provides you with that your outcome measures can be derived from that output. For example, if you needed to acquire respiration and your outcome measures were all based around respiration, you can find some kind of technology that would acquire the subject's respiration activity. It's possible that that technology would provide you with a raw waveform showing the subject's respiration. From that raw waveform, you could derive specific outcome measures that your protocol may call for. Some examples of those specific outcome measures would be apneas, tidal volumes, respiratory rate, or even tidal volume instabilities. There are many more. These are just a few examples, but it is a very important part of choosing a technology. Mistake number three. Technology does not meet regulatory requirements. Over the past couple of years, the use of wearable technology in clinical trials has grown tremendously. To support this, regulatory bodies have issued requirements based around wearable technology to govern their use in clinical studies. Some examples of these requirements are built around medical device requirements and data privacy and patient privacy requirements. An example of a medical device requirement would be the FDA 21 CFR Part 820, which is a quality system regulation, which means that the manufacturer of a medical device has to have a quality system that lives up to standards supplied by the FDA. Example of data privacy and patient privacy requirements are HIPAA privacy rules. There is a full list of these requirements, and if you're interested in receiving that information, please feel free to contact me. All of my contact information will be provided to you at the end of this presentation. Mistake number four, the tech specs do not fit within the protocol. Technical specifications are the specific tech features of your device. The device here on the screen is one of our systems, the BioRadio. The BioRadio is a wireless data acquisition device which can acquire the subject's 
physiological data, such as respiration, ECG, EEG, EMG, and many more signals. The information on the right here is the bioradio tech specs, which show the different technical information about the bioradio, such as the battery life, the memory capacity, the wireless streaming connection, and the transmission range. It is important that you understand the technical specifications of the technology that you choose to ensure that that device will work with how it is required to be used per your protocol. An example of this would be if the protocol calls for the device to be taken home with your subject and used for six hours a day, three days a week. During this six hour period, the subject is going to record data to the device's memory. However, you find out that the device you've chosen can only record data for four hours a day. This type of situation is going to cause problems for the study sponsor and the technology company. However, if they would have chosen the bioradio, they wouldn't have this problem because the bioradio can record for up to eight hours. Here at Great Lakes Neurotechnologies, we frequently do work hand in hand with study sponsors to ensure that when our devices are being used in their studies, that our tech specs fit perfectly within their protocol design. Uh, mistake number five. Wearable is not validated for usability with the intended population. Think about the study population that will be recruited for your study. It is likely that the disease state that they suffer from is going to have symptoms that might make it difficult for them to use different types of technology. An example using our Kinesia 360 system. If you think about Parkinson's disease patients, they have a great deal of motor symptoms that they have to deal with, such as they could have tremor, they could have slowed movement, or even stiff movement. This type of, these types of symptoms can make it difficult for them to put sensors on their wrists or hands or even to use a mobile application on a smartphone. Since the Kinesia 360, sorry, since the Kinesia 360 system consists of two sensors that are worn on the wrist and the ankle and a mobile application on a smartphone, our team here at Great Lakes Neurotech worked with patients with PD to go through grounds of usability testing to ensure that the patients could use our sensors, put them on properly, and also use the mobile application on the smartphone. Mistake number six, minimizing the importance of training. Once you have your technology picked out, it is very important that everybody that is going to be using the technology is trained on how to do so. There could be multiple people that will need to be trained on the technology depending on the protocol. Some examples of who might need to be trained could be the principal investigator, the CRA, the study coordinator, and if the technology is being sent home, it could be the patient or maybe even the patient's caregiver. An example from my experience is I have worked on multiple studies where the study population was children with Rett syndrome. One of the things that is commonly acquired in Rett syndrome study is pulse oximetry. One of the ways that pulse oximetry can be acquired is by a finger sensor. Rett syndrome patients have uncontrollable hand movements and they also wring their hands quite frequently. This can make having a sensor on the finger very difficult to keep on and also to get good quality data from that sensor. For these studies, I worked closely with the clinical site and trained them to train the caregiver on how to properly put the sensor on the patient's finger so that it would stay on during the hand wringing and hand movements and also acquire quality data for the study sponsor. In addition to this type of training, other ways that we help study sponsors ensure that 
their team is trained properly on our technology is by creating custom user guides for both the clinical sites or the patients and caregivers, instructional training videos, and then also in-person trainings, either at the clinical sites or over WebEx. Mistake number seven, assuming the wearables will be at the clinical sites when they're needed. The last thing that a study sponsor wants is a call from one of their clinical sites saying, I have a patient here ready to be screened, but we have no devices. Where's the technology? One of the most important things that a study sponsor can do is plan out a delivery schedule for the technology to reach their sites. Some of the things that can be thought about during this process would be vendor turnaround time. How long does your vendor need to turn it around? How much notice do you need to give them? Is there a specific courier that needs to be used? Are your sites all in the USA or do you need to ship internationally? If you're shipping internationally, you need to consider customs and VAT fees and duties. Delivery timelines. How long is it going to take for the technology to get from the technology company to each clinical site? In regards of supply, how many devices are needed at each site? Once the devices are at the site, can they store them there? And can they safely store them there? When is the technology needed there? And what is the recruitment speed for each site? Are you going to have to ship more devices in a month? Or are you going to have to ship more devices in two weeks? Logistically, think about how long is each subject going to need the technology? Is it possible that one device can be cycled between multiple subjects? If your subjects are going to be staggered, and you can use one device for more than one subject, this is going to be much more cost effective for the study sponsor. And then also, if your subject decides during the study that they don't want to participate anymore, how is that technology going to get back to the site? These are all things that a study sponsor should think through and consider when planning out delivery, supply, and logistics of technology to the sites. Mistake number eight, assuming the data will appear and in the required format. So if your technology goes home with the subject and your subject is using this technology a couple times a week and they are recording their physiological data to the technology's onboard memory, how is that data going to get from the technology's internal memory to your analysis team? There are many different ways that this can happen, and it's important that the sponsor work with their analysis team to figure out a proper delivery plan for the data. A couple examples of how data can get from the sensor to the analysis team would be data can be uploaded to a cloud via Wi-Fi. Cloud portals are becoming very popular, and it makes it very easy for data to be accessed very quickly by analysis teams. Uh, sensors can be plugged into computers via USB and transferred almost immediately to a database. Same thing um, with getting data off of an internal memory card. Once the data is transferred to where it needs to be for the analysis team to recover it, what format does it need to be in? Does it need to be in a spreadsheet? Does the data analysis team need a raw waveform? Or do they need a spreadsheet with numerical values? These are all things to consider, and also compatibility with other systems that the team might be using. Mistake number nine, assuming custom requirements are understood. It is very common that a study sponsor might need a custom item built out for them for their study. An example of this would be if you have an piece of technology that has an eight hour battery life, but your protocol requires that you need a 24 hour battery life on that piece of tech. You can work with your technology company and request that they build you out a module to create that 24 hour battery life. 
However, this does take time, effort, and money, and it is very important to ensure that all parties involved are on the same page. Parties involved will be the CRO, the sponsor, and the tech company. As you see here, each one of these people are thinking about something different. You want to make sure that everybody is thinking about the same thing and that everyone knows the same details and understands all specifications and requirements. The way that this can be done is the sponsor can relay all of their requirements, their timelines, and their budget to the technology company. The technology company can create a mock-up of the work and have the sponsor sign off on that mock-up before work begins. That way, it is ensured that everybody is on the same page. Mistake number 10, not creating a plan for compliance monitoring. Your subject has your technology at home and they are using this technology Tuesdays and Thursdays for three months for six hours a day. They're recording their physiological data, everything's going great. How are you gonna know that they are doing this as they should be for the full three months. What if they decide halfway through that they don't want to do it anymore? When you receive your data at the end of the three months and you expect data for 90 days, but you only have data for 30 days. That's why it's important for a study sponsor to create a plan for compliance monitoring. Wearable technology makes it a lot easier than it used to be to create this type of plan. Wearable tech provides easy ways to connect with your subject to see data logs and activity of using the technology. Clinical study, the, sorry, clinical sites can check up on these data logs and they can even call the subjects if needed. However the study sponsor wants to create this plan, it's just important that they do have a plan in place to ensure that the subjects are using the devices as they should be throughout the entire study. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all for your time. If you would like copies of the slide or a list of the wearable technology requirements, please do feel free to contact me at any time. Also, if you would like to discuss any of these topics further, I am always open for discussion, and you can reach me at 216-446-2431. Thank you again.